As executive director of the Chattahoochee Hills Charter School, Chester Asher wants every child to act as if they were born to do something great. The rural campus is located 30 miles south of Atlanta, and all classrooms are connected by outdoor pathways. To get from one place to another, students are exposed to the natural world, and by using the arts, agriculture, and the environment to cultivate curiosity, Chat Hills has been shattering by-the-book approaches to education. I'm Gail O'Neill. Join me and my producer, Felipe Barral as Chester Asher shares his vision for imparting knowledge, building character, and teaching kids to see themselves as agents of change on this episode of Collective Knowledge, because spreading knowledge is the most altruistic thing we can do as human beings. I'm guessing you had a standard traditional education. Yes. You were born in Ghana, yep. and then your family moved to England, England mm -hmm. when you were two years old, yep. and then? And then uh, we moved to DC, and so I spent one year in D.C. Uh, where, in, in fifth grade, and then sixth grade on through high school, I was in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so very traditional, you know, by the book, uh, you know, in a building. <laughs> Did you like school when you were oh, a kid? I love, I love school. What was it that you loved about it? Um, I, like, I was always curious, and so I, I was able to satisfy a lot of my curiosity. I, was like, I liked to debate, and so I debated a lot with people asked a lot of questions, um, yeah. And do you feel that schools encourage, well, I guess I should ask, mm -hmm. can curiosity be taught? What you came into the classroom with, could that be taught? Because I think that's mm -hmm. fundamental to learning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it can be taught. I think it can be, um, it can be cultivated, okay. right? And so I, I, I don't think you can give or you can impart, right? I can, I can show you, I can impart you how to add or, or do multiplication. I can give that to you. But curiosity, I think, has to be inspired. Um, and it has to be, I think we all have it in us, right? I think those things are already in, so we have to, our job is to bring it out, right? To put kids in the settings that they will start to wonder, they'll, that, that they'll start to question what is going on. <laughs> How does this setting encourage curi yeah. curiosity? Yeah. And have you seen it work? Oh, definitely. I mean, just in the, in the learning garden, right? Like, where is this coming? Like, you see these things and you're like, where does it come from, mm -hmm. right? Um, like, how does this start? Like, wh like, what is this? You just, so, it, so it's visually, like looking at different things that you don't usually see, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, a broccoli plant actually looks very different than the broccoli you see. In shrink in the, wrap. In, in, the, in the store. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, you know, when kids come out and you say, this is broccoli, Right, automatically they're like, what? what are you talking about, right? It's so automatically there's a natural curiosity that comes out because what you're showing them is different than what they've come to know and come to believe. And so really um, through experience, right? L looking at things, feeling things, uh, smelling and tasting things, um, I think can really bring out that curiosity as to um, have kids start to wonder. What was the, think the thinking behind having a few small buildings, mm -hmm. no interior corridors or yeah. hallways, yeah. where children are constantly running back and forth. Yeah. I think because you're, you're, when you're in a building like that, usually that you're caged. Right? It's very confining and very confined. And you don't have this, the stimulation, um, you don't have those stimulants to inspire curiosity of the outdoors, mm -hmm. of nature. Right? You're, you're gonna see the same thing every day like in a building, right? Whereas here, like, you know, sometimes you see like a huge, we saw it down there, like a huge spider web, right? And the spider and its prey. And, it, and you just stop and like, what is going on here, right? You see like butterflies usually like in the summertime all over the campus, mm -hmm. right? There are bees, right? right there, you know, there's positives and negatives about that, right? You ha just have things growing and dying, mm -hmm. right? That it inspires that curiosity. Right? and you're out and you, you breathe the air. You know, so many times people go to places like this for retreats, right? And to calm themselves and to center themselves uh, and to have that opportunity to do that every day. You can do that right before you go to class. When you talk about the life cycle, you told me earlier that mm -hmm. a couple of chickens met an untimely demise thanks to a dog. So yeah. the kids came to school and saw what and how did they respond? Yeah, and they saw death, right? And it was like, what happened? What's going on? Some of them were, I think one or two were crying. Um, but you had to explain that, you know what, nothing lives forever. Um, and sometimes these things happen, right, in, in nature, 
And again, not taking ourselves out of nature. I think a lot of times when humans talk about nature, we're talking about like something. Like, no, we are also nature, right. right? And so sometimes death happens with us, mm -hmm. right? And how do we deal with that, right? Yeah, it was killed by a dog, not for, not for uh, prey, mm -hmm. uh, not to eat. The dogs just play with the chickens that way in, in a rough way that, that, kills, that killed them. And so sometimes we, you know, there are reasons why sometimes we kill each other, mm -hmm. sometimes for self-defense, sometimes maybe there's a good reason, mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of times there's not, right? And what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. And to really wrestle with those questions and that reality. And you're dealing with kids K through H, mm -hmm. so that's uh, what, 12 year olds, 13 year olds? Um, I think about five to 13, 14. We tend, we tend to be very protective of children in this culture. They mm -hmm. shouldn't know about death. No, they shouldn't yeah, know about yeah. things that will make them mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. How do they cope with the realities when, when confronted with them and when you all explain to them? Yeah, some, again, some cry, um, but we got more questions than, and again, that, that curiosity. We got more questions than any other like, response. Mm -hmm. Like, what happened? How this happened? What can we do to, to stop this from happening again? What's going to happen to those dogs? Are those dogs going to come back? Um, and those, that's real, right? And what I tell students all the time, you don't have to wait until you leave school to like be in the real world. Mm -hmm. Like you're in the real world right now. And so if we can empower scholars now to see themselves as agents of change, to see themselves as people that matter and their actions matter, when they're adults and when they are out of school, my, my hope is that they, they feel 10 times more empowered to actually make change and to be agents of change and agents of good uh, in the world. Is that a hard sell when you're trying to get your certification from mm -hmm. the your Fulton County School Board? Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah, is that a hard sell or do people get it? I, I, think, it's, I think it's a hard sell. Um, I think it's it's because it's, it's so different. It's like, you know, we, we talk about math, science, ELA, social studies, you know, the state standards. Like, what are you talking about? This this other stuff, right? And so our curricular framework that we call, that we use is called expeditionary STEAM. Um, STEAM, like? STEAM. Okay. And so STEAM is, stands for science, technology, engineering, art, and math, okay. right? And that really helps us to ground a lot of what we do in things that have applications. And so, um, you know, we're going to, we're, there's a school bus down there that we just brought on campus. And what's gonna happen with it is scholars are going to, sixth graders are gonna design what the outside of the bus looks like, uh, what the, um, you know, the paint should be, what the landscaping should be around it. Seventh graders are gonna design the interior. It's gonna be a music studio. So they're gonna design the interior, right? Are we gonna have a recording booth? Where's the equipment going to go? Uh, what the, what's the flooring should be and why? And the eighth graders are actually going to be the ones doing the renovations to turn that, that school bus into a music studio, right? And the, the, the science, the technology, right, the sound engineering that that takes, uh, it's, it's a real application, oh, yeah. right, of a really complex, uh, regular um, educational material. But it, it, it gives it meaning, right? Mm -hmm. That school bus will then be used for years and years and years because of not just their learning, but their work. Right? And so for, for us, it's about real work. Like, what are you doing that, that is going to impact the world in some way? So every trimester, they have, a, uh, they have a question. They have a real world question. And so this first trimester is focused on agriculture. Next is going to be in the environment. And third trimester is going to be on art. And so, for example, our kindergartners, their question is, uh, how do we, I think it's something about how do we protect the bees, mm -hmm. right? And so to do that, like they have to study the impact of bees in the environment. They have to, you know, do some addition and subtraction of how the bee populations have grown and declined. Um, and then they have to you know, be really creative about how uh, we plan to foster the growth uh, of bees. Uh, knowing the purpose that they serve in our world and especially for our, our produce and agriculture. I think we hold teachers and educators to standards that we sometimes fail to hold parents to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so whenever we talk about failing schools, we talk about what schools are doing wrong mm -hmm. or failing, you know, 
academically and so on, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about parental involvement. Mm -hmm. How important is that? And and how is this? I mean, I see kids here playing on a structure that I just saw a dad build. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's it's really important. Um, you know, a lot of our parents actually. I think it's part of the nature <laughs> of the school that it, it's attracted families and parents who see themselves as like a big part of the school, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, they um, built, they're building the playground. Uh, we planted the orchard last uh, summer. Uh, what kind of fruit? Back there, pear, uh, apples, and orange trees, mm -hmm. I believe. It was orange, pear, apples, there's some other type of uh, okay. tree out there. We have blueberries uh, back there that parents uh, helped us to, um, to plant. And so I think uh, it, it, it's attracted, I don't think, there's not a lot intentionally I think we did, but it has attracted parents who are super involved. And in my, in my 16 years in education now, the most involved parents I've ever experienced anywhere in the world. Um, and I think it's part of um, the real world work that we stand for, that parents see themselves as part, like it's not, it can't be separate from their kids and it can't be separate from them. Like this is what they want the lives of their kids to be, not just the education of their kids to be. Have you taught outside of the U.S. in your 17-year career? I haven't taught, I've consulted. Okay. And so I consulted in Dubai, uh, I consulted in Sweden, um, and everywhere I travel, I always have to see schools. And so I was recently in um, New Zealand, and I, 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 I uh, went to some, some classes there and to take away some gems as to how they go about uh, education. What really do you think, when you think about formal education, mm -hmm. what do you think are the most overrated gems, as you would put mm -hmm. it, and what are the most undervalued that we should be paying more mm -hmm. attention to? Uh, um, the most overrated, um, hmm. I'll come back to overrated. I'll okay. think about that. Yeah. But underrated is, in, my, in all my years in education, the number one obstacle for, for students to success has been their belief in themselves. Mm. I've had scholars who struggle but believe that they're great and they're amazing and do fabulous. And I've had scholars who are, who are naturally gifted but who suffer from a low self-esteem mm. and they do horribly because they don't believe, if I don't believe I can, I won't. Mm. Uh, and if I believe I can, even if maybe I shouldn't be able to, <laughs> they, they make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, the, the most underrated um, impediment to success. Mm -hmm. and, and the most underrated uh, factor to, to success yeah. uh, is that a scholar's belief, a kid's, right, and a person's belief in themselves. Um, I, think, I think a lot of times, in terms of uh, things that are overrated, I think we focus a lot on the different types of curriculum. And, a lot of that I don't think really matters sometimes. It's, it's you know, there, there are millions of, you know, different books, there are millions of uh, different scopes and sequence, sequences for how you should structure a child's education. Um, there are a million tools and resources that you can use. Um, but at the end of the day, for what, I think it's to, to what end, right. right, are you using that stuff for? Mm -hmm. Is it just to, to prepare them for a test? Is it, to um, empower them in some way? Uh, is it to change the world? Um, and I think the last two are things that, that we actively seek to do, empower kids to change the world. How does tr a traditional classroom, mm -hmm. you know, the typical setup with kids sitting at, in desks, mm -hmm. all facing in the same direction, mm -hmm. how might that impede or, or build on their natural talents? Or how is it failing them in that way? I, I think, you know, I think, and humans are diverse, right? And I think um, a lot of the failings of schools have been to have a model and saying, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing it. And naturally, there's gonna be a bell curve of scholars who, and of scholars that at one end who just, it just doesn't fit for, mm -hmm. right? And, and then fail, and they're not successful, and then face all the consequences of not being successful. Uh, and I think, to a large part, our entire educational system is way too monolithic. Mm -hmm. And so there are huge groups, right, maybe even the majority of students who don't succeed uh, because you have this, this one way of educating kids. And so one, 
just the school, even if the school had one weight, the fact that it's so different, mm -hmm. I think provides a choice, provides diversity of experience and a diversity of modality to educate a child. But even here, even within the school, we really try to focus on different ways of educating children. So, you know, there are times where we're in the class, right? And we have that at desk and they're taking the test. Mm -hmm. right? And then there are times where they're in the trails, right? And they have- And a, that's considered a, part of their learning. Is, yep. And they they have a notebook. They have what we call discovery journals, and they're writing down their discoveries and things that they notice and things that they sense, and then they're taking it back to the class and applying it to what they learn. Um, there are times they're right outside their class. They are uh, learning. Right. There's, there's sometimes they're in the in the garden uh, and they're growing. They're growing and they're they're planting produce. Uh, and so you know we have a lot of community service. And so. Even in the school, I think there's a lot of diversity in terms of the modalities uh, we use to educate kids. Why did you get into teaching? Why do you teach? And so I started, um, I used to want to be a senator. Right? I, I was always, I, I always said, I'm, I'm going to change the world. That, that's my goal. As a senator, not just a politician, but a, a senator. senator. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, well, you know, I think I was, partly I was limited because I'm not a natural born citizen. And so, and you know, very early in my education, I realized I couldn't be president. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a senator. Um, and pretty soon, I discovered that politics is incredibly corrupt. And I started to think that it may not necessarily be that all these people are just corrupt. It may be the system is such that it corrupts many of the people. Because I, I think there are many people in politics that I have respected that at times have done things that I'm like, why would you do that? That is. That is against some of the principles that you have stated, some of the, and, and I stopped thinking that it's just bad people or weak people, mm -hmm. but a system that corrupts. And I said, you know, I want to be part of that system. Okay. Uh, and so I actually got uh, uh, connected with teaching through Teach for America. I was a wow. Teach for America um, a core member. Uh, and so I kind of switched careers uh, in college and did Teach for America and taught in the South Bronx, right? They really just threw me in there. Uh, I graduated when I was 20, and some of my kids were 18. And so it was really, really interesting to look at this kid who is, um, who's in the eighth grade and is two years younger than me. And we are in, in like just totally different places in our lives. Mm -hmm. that, was, um, that was striking uh, to me. And it made, it get, it, it, it made me want to make even more of an impact. I was like, something's not right, mm -hmm. right? Where I can be teaching this kid, right? You know, I'm starting my career, and this kid is still in, he's still in middle school yeah. uh, at the age of 18. Um, and I think, you know, you, as a teacher, you talk such a good game, right? Mm -hmm. You talk about ideals and how you shouldn't, you know, you should use your words, right? How you, you should handle conflict resolution, how you should persevere and demonstrate grit um, and after a while, you can't keep talking about that stuff and not, not exemplifying it and okay. not doing it. And so I would catch myself on the way home from work, like cutting people off in traffic and yelling at people. And I'm like, if, if I caught my students doing this, what would I say to them? And so I would say, I think I would be a, a, a dramatically different person if I didn't teach. It, it changed me as a person because you, you talk about all these great things and you realize that at some, at some point you kind of start having to live up to them. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it changed me for the better. Um, and I think it continues to change me and inspire me. And I, I love kids. Like, I just, I, I love kids. I think they're, they're funny. <laughs> I think they're interesting. Uh, I think they inspire, they inspire me. Right, when they get it, when they are thinking about new and innovative and amazing things, you're like, this is, you, you feel as though the world is changing beneath you. Mm -hmm. I heard you talking earlier about having an experience where you were in a parent-teacher conference with mm -hmm. a student present, and you are the teacher, mm -hmm. and there was a child from Honduras, and their mother oh, is yeah. there, and you burst out laughing. Why? Tell me what was <laughs> going through your mind. <laughs> and, and so, uh, they, you know, he's uh, Honduran, his, his mother's Honduran, and they're speaking Spanish. And I speak a little Spanish, that was my, one of my minors in, in, in college. Um, but they reminded me so much of me and my mom. Right? And we were, I was born in Ghana, and so I'm, I'm African. Um, and I, I didn't know the connections to Africa were that great, where I could see someone that, you know, is from Central America, um, who looks just like me and my mom, 
their man, even though they're speaking a, a different language from a different culture, their mannerisms are so similar in terms of how they're communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And I said it was. I think it was inappropriate, but I was. I was laughing <laughs> uh, because. What were the mannerisms, and what were they? Give me, paint the picture for me. I mean, I think um, at least Ghanaians um, sometimes talk with a level of like aggressiveness, like when they and they're, like their gestures, like <laughs> why are you doing this? Right. Just that. Why? Why? <laughs> and in Spanish, she was doing the same thing uh, yeah. to him, and he was, you know. Um, you know, all, you know, very respectful, uh, you know, to, to his mom, but I was just like, this is, that's, that's me and my mom. That's how my mom would address me, um, in a different language, but that's how she would address me. Uh, who yeah. was your role model for a great teacher? Somebody who got you, somebody who could meet you where you were and help you maximize your potential, who saw you, who cared about you, hmm. who wanted for you and then made you want for yourself? And not necessarily in the classroom, but yeah. just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I had, like, a person in particular like that. Um, you know, it's funny, I had, I think I had a negative example. I had my dad, I remember I was very young, maybe like seven years old. I remember looking at him, he was a very angry guy. Mm. I remember looking at him and I was like, I really don't want to be like that guy when I grow up. Uh, and that was a big motivator uh, to me. <laughs> Him and Batman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Batman, why? <laughs> and so I, I saw Batman is just like, God, he's like, he's like, he doesn't have any superpowers, right? But he daily like changes the world. And he's humble about it, right? Humble to the point where he wears a mask, like no one knows, he doesn't want anyone to know about the good things he, he does, but does them. And I was like, man, that is like, I respect that. like. Like, this guy's doing, like, amazing things, doesn't take any credit for it, um, and is changing the world. It's like, I want to be Batman. You are changing and the so. world, yeah. <laughs> I noticed you refer to your students as scholars. Yeah. Why? And so a scholar is one who seeks knowledge. Oh. And we, to uh, really, s to help empower scholars, to help empower them, uh, we want them to be people who not, don't just sit and receive information, but who actively go out and ask, who actually mm -hmm. actively go out and, and are curious, right, and, and question, and don't just take things as they are. I think a lot of um, sometimes the apathy in the world and the state of the world is because many people think, well, this is it, right, and have kind of accepted uh, the state of affairs uh, and live in a level of complacency, which for me is unacceptable. Uh, and so we want our scholars to say, can it be different? And how can it be different? And what can I do to make it different? And so we want them to seek uh, that knowledge that will better their lives and the lives of the people around them. I imagine they're changing their parents' lives too. When, yeah. you, when you have a little person who knows that they can seek and make a change, yeah. they tend to go home and hold mommy and daddy to <laughs> yeah. higher standards. Yeah. Yeah. So what has the response of parents been to the children that you're sending home to them at the end of the day? I, I think a lot of parents really love it. Um, you know, they're, one, I think, compared to the schools that many of their, the, our kids came from, like our kids are happy here. Like they are, they're just like joyous mm -hmm. when they get home about their experience at the school. Um, and then two, as we become more and more of who we want to be in terms of that real world knowledge and that, that real world application, uh, parents are surprised like, oh, I didn't realize my kid was, was learning about this type of thing, or, or my kid was learning to become like this type of person, right? Uh, and so we have growing traits here, which stand for generosity, responsibility, uh, optimism, willingness, um, innovation, or, or being innovative, um, and greatness, right? And so we're really trying to, to improve the character, not just the knowledge, but the character of who our kids are to better impact the world, to positively impact uh, and change the world. Curiosity is so important, as you're saying, as we get older and start to accept things, you know, mm -hmm. that's just the way mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Can you give our viewers three tips on mm -hmm. ways that they might stay curious and stay engaged? Yeah, I think one, read, right? And so when we, uh, we ask our kids to read uh, a lot of, a variety of texts, um, because naturally, I, I'm, I'm a slow reader because I'll read like two pages and then I'll Google like for hours. <laughs> 15 pages. It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I think reading, exposing yourself to different material also inspires uh, that curiosity. Let's say uh, do something you haven't done before, 
right? So if you haven't been horseback riding, if you haven't been uh, hiking, um, if you don't usually go for a jog, do something that you don't usually do and reflect upon it, right? And think about how did that make me feel? Um, was it good? Was it bad? Why? Why not? What would I do differently? Um, and I think lastly, um, I think talk to, talk to different people, right? And so there are some people that I, that I may disagree with on a lot of different things. Um, but I can respect their opinions. I can respect who they are. You know, uh, who taught you people. that, Asher? Who taught you to be so respectful, to see people mm -hmm. and to not put them in a little box? To be so generous, I guess, is the word I'm looking mm -hmm. for. You know, it's probably through the racism that I experienced that, that I have this perspective now that I don't want to be that racism, right? That, um, you know, so many times, you know, I remember, I remember the security guard at my school came to the school play and was like, Asher, you were in the school play. That was amazing. I wouldn't ever think you would be in the school play. And I'm like, why wouldn't you think I would be in the school play? What about me says that? Is this I'm, when you were a child? What, yeah, when I was okay. in high school. Yeah. What about me says that I'm not a thespian, right? Or when my when it what really blew me away when my teachers would get my report card and they would be surprised. I'm like, I'm in your class every day. Like, you see the work I do. Why are you surprised that? I do similar work in other classes and I have straight A's. Like, like, it, like, like, like what would make you think that, right? Um, and so there are those, uh, you know, and I, I chalk a lot of that up to the fact that I'm black and what they expect of a black kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, right, and that's me, um, uh, you know, coming to some conclusion. Um, but then there's been a lot more explicit cases. I remember I was in sixth grade and it was me, uh, a girl, Katie, she's white, um, another uh, white person, and Sue, who's Asian. And Katie's purse goes missing. Right? This is the last period of the day, Katie's purse goes missing. And, um, and the teacher's like, uh, oh, everyone can leave except you, Asher. Mm. I'm like, okay, so me and Katie sitting at the desk. And Katie's my friend. And they're like, like uh, so where's her purse? I'm like, I have no idea where her purse is. Yeah. Like, we've all been sitting here. And what struck me is that Katie, my friend, was silent. Like, never did she say, like, Asher wouldn't take this or whatever. But she's just sitting there looking at me. I'm like, what is going on? So then they bring in the principal, and the principal sits down and is like, listen, no one's going anywhere, Chester, until we get that purse. I was like, well, we're, it's going to be a long day. And, I, yeah. and we're sitting there looking at each other. And someone from the hallway comes out and say, Katie, I found your purse by the locker. I look around, and I'm like, I think I'll excuse myself now. And I laid out so many expletives. It was, just, I just went off, mm -hmm. just like calling them every name. The, and this is the principal of the school and the teacher, just calling every name in the book. I never got a call home. No one, my parents never, like, and I, I like went down the hallway yelling expletives at the principal of the school. And no one ever brought it up ever again, mm -hmm. because I think they were so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I should have handled it. Uh, but I think they were so embarrassed by their race, like why did, out of all the people at the table, why did they think oh, I yeah. took the, <laughs> uh, yeah. the purse? And so I think it's the dehumanizing experiences that I've had that have led me to believe like, you know, other people just like me are human, right? And have the same feelings and, and you know, have the same diversity of thought and sometimes are wrong, yeah. right? But really try most of the time to be good. Okay. And so I think I try to extend the benefit um, of the doubt to everyone in the same way I would want people to really treat me like a human being, like a, a dynamic, full human being. When you see your, your young charges dashing around yeah, the campus, yeah. they, they are so happy. I yeah. feel jealous that I didn't go to school here. <laughs> Do you flash back and see yourself or is this a whole new generation, a whole new breed, a whole new ball of wax? Uh, no, I think it's it's pretty uh, similar in terms of again, like they're they're, they're people, right? They're, they're little people, and I was once <laughs> a little person, and have the same temptations and desires and excitement um, that that I once did, and so um, I'm able to really appreciate that. And uh, where too. do we as adults go wrong when we're dealing with children? Well, I think we get too mad at them oftentimes and see that see them as a problem. Like, why are you not getting this? Why are you not understand? Why didn't you? do is instead of reflecting and saying, hmm, what can I do differently? If, if I'm teaching and they're not understanding, uh, what can I do differently, um, right? Does this kid learn differently? Like, like, what can I do? And so 
it's often a projection onto them um, as to like their failures as opposed to a reflection on ourselves, right? Or why are kids behaving this way? Why, like, you don't have home <laughs> training, right? Yeah. And we push, we push it out, we put so much out, right? Um, but I think first we need to start reflect reflections of ourselves. Like, what, what can I do? What, what did I do? Uh, what can I do better? What can I do differently? And then sometimes there are issues with, with kids or parents or whatever sure. the case. Um, but it should always be part of a reflection that includes yourself. <laughs> mm. uh, because you can be part of the, the issue and part of the solution. But if you d never reflect upon yourself, you're never really part of it either. And there the will problem. always be a problem. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm really yeah. glad that you found your way to education and education found you and yes. that you're not in politics. Because yeah. <laughs> I think you are. You are definitely changing lives. Thank you, Asher. Well, thank you. It was I really a pleasure. appreciate it. it was Same really here. Pleasure. Thank and you. nice socks, too. <laughs> Coming up next on Collective Knowledge, Karen Schwartz, visual artist and psychologist with a psychotherapy practice. I keep it quite quiet that I also was doing more and more art while I was a therapist. I thought it would make me seem like a dilettante to people on both sides. And then I stopped and it, it, it seems to be very important to a lot of my patients. That? That I am involved in some uh, creative pursuit where I'm, you know, I'm going through the struggles one goes through as an artist, um, you know, writer, particularly writers or other people who are doing that feel there's an opportunity, I think, to be appreciated. Don't forget to share this episode, like us, or send us a comment. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube.